Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hello to those that are here in person and hello to those that are online. Um, my name is Dana Bishop Root, and I am the Director of Education and Public Programs here at the Carnegie Museum of Art. And we are honored to be hosting this conversation. Our collaborators, Let's Get Free, have been involved in the Carnegie Museum of Art through their participation in the 58th Carnegie International. It is an honor, I should say, for the museum to get to work with Let's Get Free. This event, oh, this program, sorry, there's, there'll, there'll be some things that are gonna happen because we're having a multiple um, directional technological um, experience here. So we're just gonna be with it. And thank you all for your grace. First, I wanna talk about Let's Get Free and bring Let's Get Free into this room. Let's Get Free is an organization that is volunteer led with people that are paid on staff now, which is an incredible thing. It is an organization that was formed to end death by incarceration. It is an organization that was formed to create pathways for people inside and outside of the carceral system, knowing that all of us are impacted by the carceral system. It is an organization that is continuing to form that brings all of us in, that recognizes the ways in which we can work towards policy change, towards relationship building, and towards love. So I thank Let's Get Free for being here. I thank Let's Get Free for all of the organizing work that it does. Members of Let's Get Free again are both inside and outside. And this particular event is a program as part of the sixth annual art exhibition um, that Let's Get Free puts on every year. And it is an exhibition that truly honors and recognizes that there is dialogue, that there is work happening, that there are ways that people exist inside and are also outside all of the time, that the world is ever expansive. And in fact, art making is one way that we work outside of systems all of the time. This year's exhibition, Picture of Free World, um, is a fundraiser for Let's Get Free. And again, it engages artists in solidarity and artists on the inside. There is an auction that's still live. So we really um, encourage those to bid. Um, it's an incredible kind of way that we support Let's Get Free. And if you're here in Pittsburgh, you can still catch it at Concept Art Gallery for how much longer, Etta? One more week from today. One more week from today. So, Etta Cetera is the brilliant mind behind this conversation and really wanted, when we were first talking about this program, it felt really important to connect the work that Let's Get Free has been doing regionally and across Pennsylvania, therefore impacting our nation um, with thinkers, writers, artists, believers, humans, that are committed to this as their life work. And I think it's also worth saying people that inspire this work. When the work of abolition is both here and not yet here and ongoing as a practice, we need to call each other into dialogue. So this conversation is both for everyone that is watching and also for the people that are doing. So without much more conversation for me, I'm going to introduce our conversationalists. Um, those that are here at the museum, there are restrooms if you leave these back doors um, and then take a left and then a right. Please be comfortable, take what you need while you're here. Um, so today joining us next to me here in person is Dorothy Burge, who is a fabric and multimedia artist and community activist. Dorothy is inspired by history and current issues of social justice. She is a self-taught quilter who began creating fiber art in the 1990s after the birth of her daughter, Maya. She is a member of Blacks Against Police Torture and Chicago Torture Justice Memorials. Both are cultural collectives seeking justice for police torture survivors. Dorothy is a member of the Women's Color, Women of Color Quilters Network. Dorothy received a 2017 Robert Rauschenberg Foundation 
artist as activist fellowship and is an envisioning justice commissioned artist. And Dorothy is here with us for the weekend. She gave a talk at Concept Gallery last night and tomorrow she will be hosting a quilt making workshop for members of our community here in Pittsburgh that's happening at the museum at 2 p.m. Um, and so then next after Dorothy speaking, we are so honored to welcome in Nicole Fleetwood. Dr. Nicole Fleetwood is a MacArthur Fellow. She is a writer, a curator, an art critic. Nicole's pathways of interest and inquiry are contemporary Black diasporic art and visual culture, photography studies, art and public practice, performance studies, gender and feminist studies, Black cultural history, creative nonfiction, prison abolition, and carceral studies. Nicole Fleetwood is the inaugural James Weldon Johnson Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication in the Steinhardt School at New York University. Nicole's book, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration, and her companion traveling exhibition, Marking Time, Art in the Era of Mass Incarceration, has brought all of this study, the connection between art making, family, relationship building, and the ways in which the contemporary art world and all of us need the artwork of people on the inside. Nicole's other books, which have deeply informed how I have stepped into art thinking and visual learning are On Racial Icons, Blackness and the Public Imagination, and Troubling Vision, Performance, Visuality, and Blackness. And then following Nicole, we will get to hear from Miriam Kaba. I'm gonna take a breath. It is astounding, you know, we write bios to be read, to be looked at, to somehow consolidate our life's work. And when I read bios, I just think about the way in which all of this work is about our humanity. And it makes me shake to read this work. Dorothy, you can probably feel me shaking. <laughs> <laughs> Mariam Kaba is an organizer, educator, librarian, and prison industrial complex abolitionist who is active in movements for racial, gender, disability, and transformative justice. Kaba is the founder and director of Project NIA, a grassroots abolitionist organization with a vision to end youth incarceration. Maryam co-leads the initiative Interrupting Criminalization, a project she co-founded with Andrea Ritchie. Kaba is the author of We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist, Abolitionist Organizing and Transforming Justice. And there has been a local book group that's been happening around this book in preparation for today, organized by our friends at Black Unicorn Project Library, Black Unicorn Library. And um, she is also the author of Missing Daddy, Fumbling Towards Repair, a workbook for community accountability facilitators with Shira Hassan, See You Soon, and No More Police, A Case for Abolition with Andrea Ritchie, a brand new book. So I hand this over. The format for all of our publics is that um, we're going to each person will give about a 10 to 15 minute sharing of their work. And um, each person will then have a moment to respond um, in the transition moments. And then hopefully we'll have time for conversation at the end. Okay. And I'm gonna stand here and help okay. advance slides. All right, okay. thank you so much. So I, I just really want to start off with talking a little bit about why I quilt. And the reason that I quilt is because I come from a long line of quilters. And so the person that you see in the pink is my mother. Next to her is my grandmother. Uh, at the top is my great grandmother, who I actually knew. She didn't pass away until I was 17 years old. And my great, great grandmother. They were all quilters. Uh, they use their quilts to create uh, blankets that we could use to stay warm. And so they use recycled materials, uh, clothing, 
and they would put these incredible quilts together and then we would use them on our beds. We would wash them and we would just continue to use them until they fell apart. So I would go, I am born and raised in Chicago. I would go to Mississippi in the summertime to be with my other relatives, my grandmothers and with my cousins. And they would always try to teach me how to quilt but it was something that I was not interested in because it is something that only old people did in Mississippi. And I was like, nope, I'm not doing that because I'm not old. So, uh, so these are the people who inspired me. And then uh, I was watching television and watching the show called Simply Quilts and decided that that was something that I could do because they were doing uh, art quilts. And to me, that was a very different venue. So this is one of the first art quilts that I did. This is my great grandmother's funeral. And uh, I had a photo of the seven sisters, which were her daughters. And so the seven sisters were at the funeral service and uh, they were all in black. And I decided to redo the photo that I had of them and to put them in African garb as a way to celebrate life and to celebrate who they were as human beings and everything that they had passed on to future generations. And then in 2008, I was contacted by the DuSable Museum of African American History. And they said, we wanna do an exhibit on lynching in America. And so I put together two quilts to enter into that exhibition. And the first one was of Ida B. Wells who fought lynching, was from Tennessee, was run out of Tennessee because of her activism against lynching and ended up in Chicago where she ran a newspaper and was still an activist, was very involved in a lot of issues that were important in the African-American community. And I thought that because of who she was and because of uh, her activism, this is somebody that I wanted to honor. So this is the first quilt that I did for uh, to actually go to the DuSable Museum. This is James Cameron. James Cameron was also in the DuSable Museum exhibition. And it's because James Cameron survived a lynching when he was 15 years old in Marion, Indiana. And when he, uh, he was with some of his friends and uh, his friends left and they robbed someone and the person was killed uh, in the robbery. And uh, someone said that they had seen him with the other two people previously. So they arrested them all. They took them all into the jail. The people from the community came into the jail, pulled them out of the jail and hung all three of them. And uh, James Cameron is the only one who survived. And uh, I created this quilt to raise awareness about who he was and what he went through. He is also the person who created the Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee. And so I went to the Black Holocaust Museum with my daughter when she was in her early teens. We met him. He was a powerful person. But what was really powerful uh, that I could not forget was seeing the scars around his neck from where he had been lynched. And then uh, I was just doing quilting uh, for people in my family and giving the quilts to people as gifts. And then Trayvon Martin was killed. And so I was out protesting Trayvon Martin. And then I decided, you know, I should do a quilt instead of a protest banner. And so what I did was created this using my great nephew uh, as the person in the quilt. And this is called Trayvon could be my son. He was in, we put him in a hoodie. We gave him Skittles and iced tea. And it was to raise awareness that this could have been anybody's son who had been killed just because they looked suspicious because they had on a hoodie. After I did the Trayvon Martin quilt, I became involved in the Women of Color Quilters Network. 
and the Women of Color Quilters Network took the Trayvon exhibit and it was part of an ex exhibition called um, Let's Get Free. And so we uh, created women of color quilters from all over the world created social justice quilts. Then after I became involved in the Women of Color Quilters Network, we also created quilts to honor Nelson Mandela when he passed. And so the first quilt that you see is Madiba because that is the name that he had when he was born. His name was changed to Nelson when he went to school because they did not want him in school with an African name. So I did two quilts, one to honor Madiba, one to honor Nelson Mandela, and it has Indinkra symbols and the Indinkra symbols mean certain things that I think represent who he was. I continue to do quilts about social justice issues. This is another one of my great nephews and this one is called I Matter. And I did this one during the Black Lives Matter movement. And also I was out protesting, trying to raise awareness and uh, trying to get justice for people who were being uh, killed uh, by the police for reasons that uh, we just could not understand and did not believe what they were saying. And so this is the quilt of my great nephew called I Matter because he does matter. The next quilt that I did was Stop Killing Us. You all should know I have a huge family. So I have four brothers and two sisters. They all have kids, grandkids, great grandkids. And so many of the quilts that I do, I use people who are in my family uh, as the inspiration to do the quilts. And so this is a quilt uh, that I did of one of my other nephews when he was out protesting and it was about police violence and it was about stop killing us. And so once again, I have a photo of him. I turned him into a quilt and I think it's a way to not only document history, but it's a way to inspire people to take action. In Chicago, we had a young man who was killed by the police. This young man had some mental health issues and he had a small knife that was about three inches long and he actually punctured a tire. And when he punctured the tire, the police were called and uh, the police came and they said, there's something wrong with this young man. We need to get a taser. So they called for backup asking for someone to come with the taser when the police officer arrived on the scene, within two minutes, he shot him 16 times, Laquan McDonald. And so I was so upset and moved by what happened to him that I used another one of my family members and turned him into a quilt of Laquan McDonald. I also pulled the autopsy report and you can see that I put the bullet holes in every place where McDonald Laquan McDonald had been shot. I am part of an organization that fights for justice in the city of Chicago, Blacks Against Police Torture. And these are two quilts that I did to honor the people who created this organization. Attorney Stan Willis, who has fought for over 40 years uh, on these particular issues and Pat Hill, who was also a police officer, head of the African-American Police League and uh, passed away. And so I wanted to honor her. She was fired five times for her activism, trying to get police to do what they were supposed to do. And for five times we went and we protested and got her put back on the police force. This is Centoya Brown, Centoya Brown was sentenced to life without possibility of parole for killing the man who bought her for sex. And so this man bought her uh, uh, for sex. She was being sexually exploited. And um, the man said, look, this is a gun. You're not leaving here. Don't try to leave here because if you do, I will kill you. And so the next day she was trying to sneak out of the house and he had showed her where he kept the gun, which was under his bed. 
And when she saw him reach under the bed, she shot him. And then she was charged with murder and life without possibility of parole. She was 16 at the time. The person who she shot was in his late 30s. Marissa Alexander, another social justice issue that I was a part of. Marissa Alexander was sentenced to 20 years for firing a warning shot to keep her abusive husband from attacking her. He was not injured in any way. The shot went into the ceiling and still she was charged and she was not able to use stand your ground like other people had been able to use. And so this was part of uh, a movement to free Marissa. And that's, those are some of the quilts that I've done over the years. And I just wanted to just bring these to talk about the work that quilts can do to raise awareness and to push people into action. And the fact that historically quilts have been used to uh, help us achieve the social justice that we needed to have as African-Americans. Thank you. Nicole. Hi. Good afternoon. Sorry, I'm I'm not on my computer and I was having a little bit of a delay. Can everyone hear? Can you hear me? Is it, are you able to hear me? Okay. Um, Miss Dorothy, thank you so much for that beautiful presentation. And I want to say it's really meaningful being here with you and Mariama in conversation. I'm, um, I'm a great admirer of both of your work and learn so much from your practice and commitment. Um, I also want to say that um, it, I every time I have the opportunity to be in deep dialogue with Black women leaders, um, it just, it's um, a gift, um, a gift from divine spirit. So I am so um, grateful to be here. I also want to say that you were talking about, you showed that slide uh, about, um, I'm sorry, if, can you all see my slides? Something's sort of, are you able to see my slides? This is not usually my format, so. We you can see your slides. Okay, okay, okay. Um, great. Um, Ms. Dorothy was talking about the her um, mural Seven Sisters. And, um, you know, I just, this weekend I'm in Dallas celebrating um, one of my aunts uh, who turned 70 today. And my grandmother had, um, eight, eight, nine daughters. So um, seven of her nine daughters will be here this weekend today to celebrate. Um, and, but I also want to say that so much of what I've learned about how we heal and how we love um, and how we uh, resist captivity and um, evisceration is through the Black women in my life, my aunts and my grandmother. Uh, my Aunt Sharon, whose birthday is today, is also grieving the fact that her son, Alan, um, was sent back to prison this week. Um, he had served 21 years and actually visiting him in prison over those 21 years was a largely the inspiration for the work I was doing, I've been doing on on uh, mass incarceration and art, uh, and he was out for seven years. This is Alan, uh, Aunt Sharon and me um, from Alan's earlier bid. So we're also celebrating Aunt Sharon's birthday, but we're also grieving the fact that Alan is back um, in captivity. I, you know, it was, but it was from these experiences of visiting um, Alan during his, his first time in prison um, that I really got, inspired by the visual worlds of people held in captivity. And I started thinking, you know, like you were talking about the mural work, I mean, the, um, the quilting work about the importance of the history of black freedom struggles being one of 
envisioning freedom and actually practicing freedom through our cultural pra cultural practices, what we make as a reflection, not only of uh, spirit, but also of world possibilities, right? That the world we want for all of our children and our grandchildren, and I believe that time is just a construction, um, is a world we want for the people of our past, of our ancestors, is a world that we have to keep, continue to, to co-create together. Um, and so much of that work takes place among people um, who have very limited resources and whose imagination is activated as one of the primary vehicles for liberation that um, imagination is core to the possibility of the world uh, that we can make right here and right now and the world that we can bring our ancestors and our future generations into. I, I believe that we can all cohabitate that space together. Um, so I'm just showing you some of the pictures of family members and visits to family members. and. And that experience of being in that temporality of, of loved ones who are serving time, who are being held in captivity. And, um, and it was always such a um, emotional, embodied, and psychic experience uh, for me when I would go in and out of those spaces and, um, and just really feeling how we were occupying different uh, experiences of time and but how love and um, I, the things that I've, I, I learned in a very modest community in Southwest Ohio around um, how we care for each other and how we survive and not just survive, but literally thrive. I mean, so much of it at, at the core of, of my growing up was a, around cultural practice, not so much visual art, although I, I'm in the visual arts, but it was my family made music. Um, and that was like, you know, I mean, freedom song, is what I heard from the minute I woke up to the minute I went to see my grandmother was always humming. And she was the choir director at her church for 50 years. And then my um, uncles and older cousins formed a funk band in our in our small town called Zap uh, with Roger Trotman. And so I, I've just been, um, it's so core to how I know to be in the world is that we um, have to practice um, and we have to engage aesthetically as part of uh, not only, again, not only surviving, but thriving. And my cousins, um, when they were in prison, they would do all kinds of ways of staying connected to loved ones. And so much of it was create, creatively engaging with writing and um, just ways of loving that were, that um, refuted what prisons were doing, which is isolating and creating these boundaries between um, beloveds. So marking time, um, Dana mentioned the project I've been working on for a decade, um, really started with my family's album of, of incarceration. And over the time it's grown into collaboration with, um, with you know, dozens and dozens of artists, uh, many of them who have been in prison or currently in prison and really learning, uh, being uh, understanding what an honor it is to be a student of people who can teach me through their struggles um, about what it means to dream and to make and to envision freedom from sites of captivity, whether one is being held um, in you know solitary confinement or sentenced to life without parole or um, indefinite sentences and. Um, so much for me of this experience has been really uh, the humility of just learning um, and uh, the expensiveness of what it means to co-create and not allow state repression to uh, shape our imaginative capaci capacities and what we see as um, the world that's possible for all of us. And so I just wanted to show you some of those works like Tamika Cole, who was... Um, in prison in Alabama for 26 years and she's now out she's on um fighting you know uh 
lifetime parole. Like so many of the people I know who who have been released, um, they get released, but they're still tethered to the state through lifetime parole. And, and so any small infraction could just send them back into these, these vicious violent systems. Um, this is one of, the, one of my favorite works by Tamika that she made when she was in um, women's prison in Alabama, Unlocked Rage and Desire. Um, and being able to embrace our rage and, you know, as a, a, you know we are crim often criminalized and pathologized for rage and that, ra you know, that we have to understand the power of rage and how to activate that collectively um, as a force for change. I, you know, ground my work in the history of, of Black women's freedom struggles and abolition and understanding it not just as something theoretical, but that we have been enacting and practicing since the minute that we were, uh, you know, forcibly brought to this continent. Um, I really love this work so much by Sojourner Truth because it also um, visualizes the power that Black activists have known is um, in, in, in the visual, right? That um, I sell the shadow to support the substance, understanding, um, you know, the strategies of, of activating visual representation um, for the greater good, for our freedom movements. Um, I also work of Faith Ringel, United States of Attica, thinking about the relationship between racial violence and settler colonialism and the rise of the uh, prison state. Um, Elizabeth Catlett's wonderful uh, Sarah Graff series uh, that she made in Denwood Cell as part of uh, the Free Angela Davis campaign. And then connecting it, these uh, historic works with contemporary works by um, artists and activists like Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter, who was formerly incarcerated um, in Pennsylvania while she was pregnant. She went into labor um, and while she was in prison and um, made uh, a really powerful video uh, where she restages her 43 hours of horror as she's in labor and shackled. And she's been very active in ending the shackling of pregnant women in prison um, uh, through legislature and, and collective work. And um, she's now involved in um, a series of uh, um, arch archival activism where she's going into archives of violence against black women and girls and doing work that she calls reparenting uh, figures uh, from the past. And so this is, um, it's part of her contemporary work, The Consecration of Mary. Mary also is a video artist and has a work called The Fall of America that's currently on view as part of the Marking Time exhibi exhibition that's at the Schoenberg Center in Harlem. So if you're in Harlem, uh, the show is up until December. And then I'm just going to move through some other collaborative, collaborative works thinking about art, um, abolition, and imagination, like the um, collaboration between Michelle Daniel Jones and Deb Willis called Points of Triangulation, working with system impacted uh, people and uh, the power of visualization over stigmatization um, in the series once stigmatized. This is a collaboration between um, a group called Women on the Rise that these were uh, feminist activists and artists um, organized by Jillian Hernandez, Professor Jillian Hernandez, um, to work with girls who were incarcerated in Miami-Dade County, um, and thinking about uh, um, Miss Dorothy, you brought up Trayvon, thinking about also uh, the criminalization of youth culture and clothing, right? So it's kind of reimagining the hoodie and also the color of orange as um, this carceral color. Um, to think about possibility for these and self-representation for these young girls. Uh, Rowan Renee is an uh, uh, artist who's also involved in um, marking time and is thinking really powerfully about healing and uh, penal archives and family relationships, working with the archives of uh, their father who, was, who died while incarcerated. And then I'm going to just end with some work by Sable Elise Smith, who's also an artist in marking time. And, um, is a professor of art at Columbia and has spent 
um, most of her life visiting her father who is sentenced to life in California. Um, and so she's thought uh, very powerfully and made these uh, gorgeous works about the fragmentation of a black family and uh, intimacy through carceral systems and, and the possibility of art to reimagine uh, these connections and um, ways that she and her father serve as uh, collaborators and also his he has a, a muse for her art. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna pass, uh, I'm gonna stop and pass the mic to Miriam Akaba. Hi, um, thank you so much for that, um, Nicole, for sharing your work and your story and how you came to the work. Um, thanks also, it's such an honor to be here um, with Smith Dorothy, who I've known for a long time um, since we were, I was living in Chicago and now I've been back home in New York since 2016. I always miss everybody out there in Chicago, but I I'm kind of thankful for social media that lets me keep up with all the amazing work and wonderful organizing um, that everybody still does over there. Um, I'm going to be talking about two projects that I've been involved in. Um, as was mentioned briefly in my uh, biography, I am an organizer and an educator and a librarian now, also officially, even though I've been an informal librarian for many years. Um, and I'm going to really be speaking about how um, art has intersected with my organizing over um, over the past, you know, three decades or so. Um, and again, good afternoon to everybody. I want to thank everybody for the invitation to join you today. I'm also grateful to everybody who are taking time to be here and to the organizers of the event. Um, so yeah, I'll get started. Um, my friend and fellow abolitionist, Dr. Erica Miners, um, has written that liberation under oppression is unthinkable by design. Liberation under oppression is unthinkable by design. To me, this is why it's so important to cultivate imagination. The word imagination has been used a few times already today. Um, and I think oppression in general has a really terrible way of putting a ceiling on our imaginations. And um, artist and filmmaker Chris Vargas talks about the fact that one of the most destructive aspects of the prison industrial complex or PIC is that it creates what he called um, occupied imaginations, occupied imaginations. So we need to consistently be grasping for ways to unleash our imaginations in the face of oppression. Um, a few years ago, you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, a few years ago, I had an idea to partner with some artists um, to create a set of abolitionist imagination cards. Um, you can see some of them here on the slides. You can move to the next one. Um, and these, um, these imagination cards are free to download and uh, to share. And you can find them at um, Interrupting Criminalization's website and use them. The idea behind them was to take some um, kind of concepts and ideas that may not have been written by abolitionists, but were abolitionist ideas in my mind and in the mind of others, um, and to make these beautiful offerings um, and invite people to download them and to share them with others in their community to find ways to talk about abolition in uh, expansive ways. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, I've noticed um, over the past few years that more people are placing more emphasis on imagination in organizing circles. Um, I think that that's a good thing, but I have some caveats about that. Um, years ago, or not years ago, maybe a couple years ago, I heard lawyer and organizer Derricka Purnell say that um, imagination is neutral. Imagination is neutral. And she really is right about that. Next slide. Um, imagination doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, it could be used kind of to create good things or it can be used to create very destructive things. Some, pe some people actually imagined every part of our current oppressive system. 
And that includes prisons, policing, and surveillance. That's also the product of somebody's imagination. Um, people are always imagining. And the question, I think, is whether we're imagining towards building emancipatory and liberatory presence and futures. That's really the decision or the kind of inflection point about the uses of imagination. Next slide, please. Um, organizing is both science and art. The science is often written about in books, in manuals. Um, it's discussed in workshops and training. Um, we use words like targets and power and strategy charts and base building to kind of think about the science of organizing. I think that sometimes the art can get short shrift. And um, one of the most important lessons I've learned over the years is truly that the best organizing incorporates art in an organic way and that cultural organizing is in fact integral and very important both in generating visionary demands and in helping us win. And um, uh, Ms. Dorothy was part of uh, the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials as I was as well. And um, that example of the work of the Torture Justice Memorials in helping to create a space where um, we could have uh, kind of the ceilings removed from our imaginations and think through a different way forward, inspired by the work of people like Stan Willis and others from Black People Against Torture many decades ago around the concept of making a demand for reparations for police torture survivors. It was in part art that helped us to lift that ceiling from our imaginations and to make visionary demands that we ultimately were able to win. Next slide, please. Um, art is necessary in social movements, um, in my opinion. Social movements, in fact, are a form of collective art making. Um, anyone paying attention to one of the most important of our recent movements, um, Black Lives Matter or the movement for Black Lives, would see that this is reflected in that. Um, so much of our movements can be reactionary, and I think art pushes us to be visionary and that art helps us to think about and through difficult things, that it can help us to unleash our emotions and sometimes even begin a process of healing from the ravages of oppression. Um, that art can help us open up the possibility for imagining a different future for ourselves and for the world. And that's for many reasons, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Um, PIC abolition to me is a political project of making. Um, it is a political project of making, of constantly iterating ideas and also of dreaming. Um, I see abolition as a positive project that focuses in part on building a society where it is possible to address harm without relying on structural forms of oppression or the violent systems that increase it. Next slide, please. Um, my friend Rachel Wallace, um, who is a self-taught textile artist, um, spent over a year working with me to find a way to creatively narrate um, a project that I had been working on for many years in terms of doing research about. It's a 1947 prison massacre that took place in Anguilla, Georgia. Um, and so as part of an artist in residence opportunity at my organization, Project Nia, Rachel conceived and co-created a quilt based on some research that we did together. Um, you can see the site uh, on the slide for where you can learn more about this project. Um, but I wanted to just read a Facebook post from a couple of years ago by Rachel about the project. She wrote it in March of 2021. She said, when Miriam invited me to make a quilt telling the story of the Anguilla prison massacre, I initially felt stumped about how to do it. We know so little about the men who were gunned down for refusing to work barefoot on a chain gang in snake infested waters. There are no photos of them. And all I could find in the state records were their names scrolled on a, in a prison logbook with an entry recording the lie that they died trying to escape. 
Eventually, I made my way back to maps, as I often do. Maps can tell us so much about our history. They can document a highway system made by the prison laborers rounded up to take the place of enslaved people. They can tell the story of racist violence, whether it's lynchings in the early 20th century or police killings in the 21st. And they can tell the story of resistance of the men and women of the NAACP who fought for justice for the Anguilla prisoners or the Black Lives Matter protesters fighting for justice today. I encourage people to take a look at the um, site more closely. Next slide, thank you. Um, and you can see over here, um, this concept we talked a lot about trying to figure out because there are no photos of any of, no extant photos of any of the incarcerated men who were massacred and lynched um, in that prison massacre. Um, uh, we came up with uh, using currently uh, existing photographs of chain gangs, kind of generic. Um, with the notion, you can see the snake around there. Those were the snakes that were in the infested waters where the men refused to go in there because they were barefoot. And this is what in part led to them getting uh, killed that day. Um, and then the chains around the snakes um, as a kind of central piece of the first, the first part of the uh, quilt. Next slide, please. Um, these are other parts of the quilt that include some of the maps. That idea came from Rachel to try to understand like how we could tell and make connections between lynchings that occurred in Georgia, um, the prison, the black percentage of the prison population, along with um, where some of the protests took place during the 2020 uprisings. Um, so you can see different parts of the of the quilt represent, represented there. Next slide, please. Um, this is the back of the quilt. Um, and so it's a front and back. And I think for me, because this is really a research project that's ongoing for me, I really wanted to find a way to bring in the text part of this. And that was something Rachel was brilliant at deciding we, I had gotten in advance from the Library of Congress, um, a file that was um, from the NAACP papers um, that had a bunch of telegrams and articles and other things that the NAACP had collected about the Anguilla massacre. And so the back of the, um, of the quilt is kind of um, copied versions of some of those telegrams that the NAACP was sending to the governor and to other to the press and to other places to try to bring attention to this massacre at the time. So if you can think about this in, as the quilts being kind of its own book um, is a way of thinking about this project. Next slide, please. Um, so the story of the Anguilla prison camp massacre uh, retold through the quilt really has echoes today, of course. The Black men who were, quote, mowed down like wheat, which is what some of the survivors talked about, being mowed down like wheat, um, call out to us from the grave. And currently incarcerated Black people are also calling out to us from behind the walls. After the massacre at Anguilla, the prison camp was shuttered and the remaining prisoners were relocated to other prisons. Frankly, they of course should have all been freed instead. Those men stayed locked up. And I guess for me, the question is, what will it take for us to free them all in our time? What if full personhood for black people in the United States means freedom from policing and prisons rather than so-called protection through the police and prisons? Art, I think, might help us to think through this very difficult question. Art, however, is not a substitute for grassroots organizing and advocacy, but it can be a powerful tool and resource in the struggle for social change. As Jeanette Winterson teaches us, art can make a difference because it pulls people up short. It says, don't accept things for their face value. You don't have to go along with any of this. You can think for yourself. So for me, art has the power to disrupt. And as a PIC abolitionist, I desperately want to disrupt our punishment culture. 
In the words of my friend Amisha Patel, who is one of the best organizers I know based in Chicago, many of us feel like we have to negotiate an unworkable system. Art, making things, is about unlocking what we can create, not just managing an unworkable system. Our creative power is at the center of our organizing for justice and liberation. Hope is creative. Creative is hope. If the PIC, for me, if the PIC could be invented, so too can we imagine a world that would operate without it. And more than that, we can prefigure the world in which we want to live. Plagiarizing Claudia Jones, who famously said that a people's art is the genesis of their freedom, I'm going to say that creativity and abolition are the genesis of our freedom. So let's stay creative. Let's abolish the PIC and let's get free. Thank you so much. There's clapter happening when it was on mute, just so Nicole and Miriam, you know, there's lots of clapping. <laughs> so I think now with a few minutes left, it would be really lovely. Um, Nicole and Miriam and Dorothy, if you want to have a share a little bit of responses to each other. Um, yeah, hand it over. I, I really appreciate it. You saying that imagination is also at, um, activated by people who want to cause harm, right? So that we're not romanticizing imagination, but re re recognizing that it's an ethical engagement, right? Because, you know, we can imagine, yes, uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful tool that can be used um, for creation and for destruction. And, and some things need to be destroyed, right? We also know that destruction is not negative. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you for saying that. It just gave me a lot to, to think about in terms of what needs to be destroyed and what needs to get activated. Yeah, thank you for that, Nicole. Yeah, I think a lot about this um, because I know that I've been hearing a lot more people speaking about the idea of importance of imagination. And I think it's true. We we do absolutely need that. And I think people particularly who work with small people, with children, um, know this to be important. But we also know that children invent terror stories too, right? Like they also have nightmares that are also part of imagination. And I think we're living in other people's nightmares today. Um, but, you know, the things that they've made that are really horrible for us, mm -hmm. that are things that we're all working so hard to overturn, we're also the product of those people's imaginations. And so I think we could be we need to activate it for the good, for liberatory and emancipatory visions, not for, you know, visions that are meant to harm and to oppress. And so, yeah, I think a lot about that regularly. And I think what I, I feel is useful in, in both of your work um, in terms of the curation that you do, um, uh, Nicole, and the making basically of art that um, Ms. Dorothy does is giving us things to throw kind of our throw our ideas against um, and you know, like I'll kind of like a you know sometimes you need a wall to be able to throw something against to see what you really think about a thing and I have found um, you know marking time has been a really helpful uh, I, I went and saw it at the Schomburg and I thought you know like it's just an opportunity to walk around and to like be able to throw my ideas against the ideas of other people and see what I really think about a thing. Um, that's what I have found most useful about art is when I can be like, huh, okay, this person has a take that like makes me think this, right? It's an active engagement rather than a passive, uh, right. kind of just taking in the beauty of a thing, but like really being like challenged by those things to come up with different, better questions, not necessarily answers to those questions, but right. to create better questions for myself. So I really think both of you um, do that so amazingly. I have a question for Miss Dorothy. I was wondering, you're kind of where are you headed with your with your art? Like what I remember years ago, before you actually had your first show, I was it forcing you, remember we went on that visit and then unfortunately you had a family tragedy happen and we couldn't do that show. But you were very hesitant to put your work out there 
on display. And I'm wondering what has changed for you that you feel much more comfortable doing that now and where are you heading with your art? So what changed was I used to do art for my family members. And so I would just do pieces of, uh, and then I would give them uh, as presents because in my family, I have a big family. And in my family, you were not uh, given any store-bought presents. Every present that you were was given had to be something that was created by someone. And so we spent a lot of time in my family creating different uh, pieces of art that we could share with folks. So I had done a series of quilts and then I met a woman by the name of Dr. Carolyn Maslumi who founded the Women of Color Quilters Network. And I took the quilt that I had uh, done uh, and I was, protesting about Trayvon Martin all over Chicago as part of my activism. And so when Dr. Maslumi came to Chicago, she was doing a exhibition on Obama called the Obama Quilts. And I went up to her and I said, well, do you ever take quilts from people who are not part of the Women of Color Quilters Network? And she said to me, uh, to show her what I had. And uh, some of the people in this room have heard this story. I don't know how to use uh, technology. So I stood there with my phone for about 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. trying to figure out how to pull up the picture of the quilt and I couldn't do it. So she gave me her card. And when I went home, I packed up every quilt I had done and sent them to her house. <laughs> And then after I sent them to her house, she called me and she said, your subject matter is really incredible, but your quilting stinks. Oh and no. So you need to learn how to quilt. Oh and my so God. So that's when I really started to learn how to quilt, but I had always been doing the quilts about issues that were important to me and they were just quilts that I did because it was a way to help me heal after being out protesting on these different issues. And so then I started to say, uh, in addition to being something that could help me heal, this is something that could raise awareness. This is something that could push people to action. And I have done quilting workshops where I have worked with young people, especially teenagers, and it's been incredible to one, pass the history, and two, for them to say, okay, what's next? And so that's really been important to me. Um, Ms. Dorothy, it seems like in many of your um, quilts that you use like a photo technique that you, yes. you're in Sprite Right Photography and, and kind of yes. archival images. Can you can you just talk a so, bit more about that? Like, and your technique was working with, with, with that yeah, kind of so image? A lot of times what I will do if it's like, for example, if something hits me. So uh, Trayvon, the Trayvon Martin, being out protesting. And all I kept thinking about as I was protesting and crying and holding this sign was that this could have been a member of my family. Mm -hmm. So then I went back and took a photo of a member of my family and gave, put him in a hoodie, gave him Skittles and iced tea, took a photograph then took that photograph, created a drawing, and then uh, created the quilt using that drawing. And so that's something that I do a lot. A uh, series that I'm working on right now is about um, the people we have in Chicago. We had in Chicago a police commander by the name of John Burge who tortured over 140 African-American men and women from 1972 to 1991. And so 26 of those people are still incarcerated. And so I'm doing a series right now where I'm doing quilts of the people who are still incarcerated using, uh, because the only photos I could work from were photos, uh, mugshots. And so I'm not, I am not doing quilts that look like mugshots. So what I'm going to do is take these photographs, recreate them, so that they look like distinguished people, which they are, people who deserve to be treated like human beings, which they do, 
and then create this whole series to raise awareness about the fact that 26 people are still incarcerated who were tortured uh, into confessions. And so uh, I'm working on that right now. I'm working on a series in Chicago. We have had a number of trans women who have been murdered and nobody's talking about that. So that's something else that I'm working on is like, who are these folks who have been murdered and can I do a series of quilts to raise awareness about who they were, but also to honor them. And then the last quilt that I did was of Albert Whitfox. Albert Whitfox served 44 years in solitary confinement in Angola prison and locked up 23 out of 24 hours a day. He got out of prison after 44 years. He was one of the Angola three, Was uh, got out of prison three years ago, came to Chicago and around the country and spoke about what it was like to be in solitary confinement uh, for 44 years and to be locked up for 23 out of 24 hours. And so I met him when he came to Chicago I actually took a photo of him, asked him if I could turn him into a quilt. He laughed because he was like, okay, if that works for you. So uh, so I took the photo, uh, did a quilt of him, uh, and Albert Woodfox passed away of COVID uh, in April of this year. So I, that's also to honor him and his legacy mm -hmm. and to respect what he went through mm -hmm. and to acknowledge the fact that he created this really incredible book where he talked about the impact of solitary confinement. Yeah. Wonderful. I guess we could also take questions from people in the audience if you have any, we're happy to share. What was the book called? What is your book called? It's called Solitaire, Solitary, and uh, he wrote it himself, and uh, it's an incredible book, and yeah, I encourage you to read it. It is. It's yeah. one of the best yeah. books written about uh, prison that I've ever read, actually. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. Me too. It's it's so powerful, um, and he was nominated for some awards for he that was, too, The right? National yeah, Book yeah. Award. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I I have a question about the playing cards, the, uh, yeah. the imagination. Um, can you talk about the idea of play and the play with these with these kind of materials too? So that you know, as we're thinking about destruction, imagination, play. You brought up children. Yes, I love kids. Um, yeah. I love kids and, as opposed to adults. I don't like adults. Yeah. Well, and, ch and children kind of understand these relationships in a way, in a very organic way too, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, yeah. assembling, disassembling, that things, yeah. some things need to get disassembled, right? Like yeah. they'll take Legos apart. And we, so I'm wondering if you can just talk, I, I just, I love the idea of play. I Play is a big part of my spirit. So yeah. Yeah, um, I love it. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And that's actually so serendipitous that you brought this up because you're not, you don't know this, but I've been working on a long-term project about exactly this play. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, I'm taking a chrysalis year next year, which means I'm going to be on official sabbatical for a year. Um, and I am going to be working on uh, more deeply thinking about um, play and abolition. Um, and so, yeah. So anyway, the, the imagination cards are, because I've always loved postcards. I collect them actually. I've collected postcards for like 30 years and I have them, um, they're mostly postcards related to black life. Um, and I always have found particularly, I think people don't realize I did a, an exhibition many years ago where I used my postcard collection um, as the basis of the uh, exhibition. And one of the things I learned about uh, was how incredibly popular postcards were. And somebody mentioned a young person I had been talking to was like, asked me a question about like, were postcards the Twitter of the 19th, you know, late 19th early 20th century and I was like absolutely that's what it what they were they were like the social media of the time um 
so yeah, so I think that um, play is so, so it's important, really important because the whole idea of occupied imaginations, there's also this concept of colonized imaginations, which um, the prison industrial complex, that's what it does best is that it actually colonizes our imaginations. So for example, because we can't think of, you think of the kind of 1980s version of Margaret Thatcherism where she said there is no alternative which she was talking at that point to, there is no alternative to capitalism. Right. In the same way, the PIC tells us there is no alternative to policing prisons and surveillance, that actually even you trying to deign to think about that is itself so transgressive that they will pound you into the ground with that notion. And because they've colonized the concept of safety to the point where we can't even use the term safety without automatically thinking of the cops, right. that because of those things, we have to think about um, disrupting the ways that we have now let the PIC seep into play. Um, you from you all have experienced this. You've seen the cops and robbers games. You've seen your own family members, if you have children or if you are of children in your life, from a very young age being attracted to the spectacle of cops and robbers, locking people up, all of that kind of stuff. And that's been that's not in that's not natural. It's actually something that's been taught and retaught and retaught and retaught through popular culture and the play children do, um, their books, the children's books they read, like it is so powerful. So yeah, I'm I'm obsessed with this idea. Um, and part of me writing children's books is also been my attempt um, for the last few years to tell different stories to children um, as a way to push back against the ways that our imaginations have been colonized through play and through reading and through all these other different kinds of ways to think that there is no alternative. That's it. This is just it. It's just always been like this. It will always be like this. You shouldn't even bother to resist, you know, that it's, it's so much in the, yeah. So thank you for asking that. And I'm looking forward to in a couple of years, sharing what I come up with. <laughs> And I, I also think that play is really, really important. I did a workshop for some young people last summer. And last summer, these were uh, teenagers uh, between the ages of 13 and 16. All of them were residents of public housing in Chicago. And we were doing a quilt series. And I said to them, I don't want to tell you all what we need to do for uh, the series of quilts that you all want to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you all in a circle. We're going to learn the circle process of communicating with each other. I said, and then I'm going to leave and I'm going to come back and I want you to tell me what the subject matter is going to be. So when I left, I came back in an hour and they said, Miss Dorothy, we know what we want to do. We want to do gun violence. And I thought, how interesting that 13 to 16 year olds want to do a series of quilts about gun violence. And that really speaks to the fact that how gun violence is impacting us as a community. And so I, they did some powerful quilts and it would be nice for them also to be able to play. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Sam. Can't be good. I'm good. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you. Um, first of all, you know, you just based on the product of your time. Um, the work is already so profound. And um, it just went back to the movies, you know? It just, um, it's big. You know what our country is going through, what our world is going through. Um, it's like a bittersweet, and on the other side, you know, it brings me joy to know that people are really truly fighting. You know, I did twelve and a half years in Wall Street, my friend was mentioned in eleven, and um. We understand. We truly, truly understand. We truly, truly 
in the you know, um, I'm a board man, I'm an advocate, you know, um, you know, fighting for people incarcerated, men and women, you know, with the children incarcerated, you know, it's, and it's very painful. But the work itself is like, I know, but feel outside and then I'll feel on the side. You know, not grew up with quotes and everything, but you know, we see what y'all do, the art that y'all do. I'm just thankful and I'm just so grateful. And I'm listening to the people that come to my mind, you know, you see all these people and all this that y'all doing is the um, Central Park Five. I always think about them, you know, I enjoy stories of the world and everybody else, but when I say that movie, I was thinking, I thought that I would say it one time. And my question to you is to and we probably thought about doing something based upon this story. Um, have you ever collaborated, you know, with um, young boarding parents or, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's my question because they probably we have so many people that's been touched, that's been affected, that's been in everything, and none of us worse than the other. But you know, you always have, I'm talking about me, someone in particular in your mind that shakes you, and you know, you can't get out of everything. And to me, the central part of my, you know, is always in my heart, like everybody else is. But does anybody want to go first? I think you can go ahead, Miss Dorothy. I had a hard time hearing from where I am. So, okay. yeah. So the, the question was about um, creating uh, art and acknowledging the art that we do and to talk about the emotional uh, impact that our art has and something that really has struck her very deeply is the Central Park Five. And have we thought about doing anything about the Central Park Five? Thanks. Yeah, I can say that this is also an issue that has really struck me uh, in a very strong way. I always think uh, for me that I would love to do the Central Park Five, but I would like to meet them first. And I would like to get their permission before I started uh, to do a quilt series on them. Because I think the story that they have is really powerful. I think it's still relevant today. I, I think that even as I was talking to young people in my family, one of the things that I was saying to young people in my family, as I said, do you know who actually took out a campaign ad against the Central Park Five? And they were like, no, Auntie Dorothy, who did that? I was like, Donald Trump. You all need to know your history. It's important. And so I think that, you know, what happened to the Central Park Five is important. In, in Chicago, the Chicago area, we had the Dixmore Five. The Dixmore mm -hmm. Five, same situation. Convicted of a crime they did not commit. Young woman was found murdered. Uh, they arrested five high school students who went to prison for years for a crime they did not commit. And so I think that this is something that is really important. And I think that it's something that is happening all over the country. 
I, I also would just quickly say before I'll pass on to Nicole that um, I think the important things are for people to make their own art. And I think um, Yusuf Salam has taken the story of his yes. incarceration. He's written a book about it for adults. And then he just wrote with Evie Zaboy, just put out a, a young reader's version of that book uh, called Punching Air, which is actually very good. Um, so I like I like the idea of people making their own pieces from the, using their own voices to tell their own stories. And I think to the extent that we can do that, um, we're all better off for it. And uh, so, yeah, so I look forward to seeing the continued art making that they make out of their experiences because I'm always interested and I'm a big, uh, you know, big supporter of that. So go ahead, Nicole, sorry. Um, I agree with you about um, people making their own art. And you know, I, I couldn't hear the question fully also. So thank you, Ms. Dorothy, for repeating it. But what I did hear from um, the person who asked the question was like um, so much emotion in the voice. I could hear yes. the emotion, even though I couldn't hear the question. And um, I just, you know, for me, like when I think about the Central Park Five too, I, I have this visceral reaction. And, and, and when I think about, well, you know, why am I, why is my reaction so intense to this? And said, oh, because I knew, I grew up in a very average sized town in Southwest Ohio. We have those versions of, you know, the Scott School of Boys. We have, we just have the versions of that historically um, in the smallest place, smallest places, you know, it's not just in New York City, right? This, this massive metropolitan. And, so I think we all, um, not we all, but I think there is a profound connection that many of us feel to how horrifying uh, that those particular cases are or were, but how they also just resonate with the everyday lives of vulnerable Black folks, especially young boys and girls who get swept up into this vicious, um, anti-Black um, system. Um, and, you know, as much as we talk about imagination and what we can co-create, I think my, you know, I, I mourn every day around this and because there is profound loss and so much of what can never be recovered. There's, you know, no amount of money or attention in the world that you can give to people who've suffered through these systems, uh, not to mention those who don't survive it, right? And so there's so much for us to grieve. Um, and I think the grieving, and for me, the grieving and the creating uh, goes, goes together. I'm working on a new book right now, and there's so much grief um, as I'm creating it. There's just so much grief coming out and we can't lose sight of just these profound losses that are completely unrecoverable. Absolutely. I'm so with you on that point of the emotion, the grief. Um, and, you know, I do want to say that I like to think all the time about where there's grief. There was also great love. Um, and part of this work that we do, I think, in community um, is not just work that is rooted in uh, a sense of duty or obligation or, um, uh, you know, sense of uh, interconnectedness with people, even people we don't know. There's also just great love, um, so much care, so much love that brings to the front all that grief and that sadness and that joy and all the things that are part of it. It's livingness as Catherine, you know, McKittrick teaches us, right? The concept of livingness, that that is, that is life. That is the journey. Um, and yeah, I, I'm so grateful for all of the work that everybody in the audience chooses to do um, in whatever ways you choose to do it. Um, and I hope that, you know, to me, we have to keep moving and we have to keep pushing and we have to keep struggling. It's, and that's our responsibility. Our responsibility is to do what we can, where we are in the ways that we can and to keep pushing and to keep struggling. Um, and yes, I do believe that eventually we will win. I don't know that it will be in my lifetime and it doesn't so much matter. Um, 
it, the work you do makes a difference for you. It makes a difference for somebody else. It makes a difference for the world, um, even if you don't see it in that way happening in our timeline. So yeah, just a thought. Yeah, and one of the things I wanna say is that as somebody who has been involved in the movement to free people who were tortured by John Burge, uh, to see them return home has given me so much joy. And I, I have received so much love from the survivors of torture. It's been an incredible experience. You know, my daughter has like adopted several of them as her, uh, you know, brothers. And so it's like, I, I have kind of a growing family because of, of the activism that we do. And I think that that's something too that is really important. It's yeah. like, this is another way for us to connect with people and to change the world is that we, you know, create a world where love is there. Yes. And I would also say that I love the point that you made, Miss Dorothy, that sometimes we do win. Sometimes yeah. people do get restitution. Sometimes people do come home alive. We just heard yesterday that Rochelle McGee, who is the longest serving political prisoner in U.S. history, after 53 years locked up wow. or just wrongly convicted, wrongly locked up, right, that he's out and yes. that the prison didn't win. Yes. The prison did not win. The carceral state did not kill him you know, and he's out and that's victory. And I just think we have to keep thinking about those things in that context, um, that the, they don't always win. And that's, that's, and if they were so secure and so sure that we wouldn't win, they wouldn't have be bringing out all these big guns against us on a regular basis. Right. Um, so the system is insecure, which is why we know we can win. I think the other thing that, that I want to raise is the fact that when people are returning from prison, they need services, they need help. And to expect somebody to return from prison after being incarcerated for years, decades, and to think that they can just fit in and go on with their life is not a real reality. That we need to have services that will help them with their mental health counseling, that will help them with housing, that will help them with medical care, all of these things are also part of the movement to me. And that to me is also part of justice for people who are returning citizens. Thank you, Kathy. Well, I wanna just echo what Mariam said about where there is great love. I think it's possible that we can say where there is great love, there is also great gratitude. So want to be so thankful for each of you sharing so much today, bringing all that you are and all that you have been and will become into this space. Everyone that is here in person, arriving with all that you are and all that you are doing for this movement and for moving all of us. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for arriving together. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye, Nicole. Bye. Bye, Bye, Bye Miss Dorothy. This is great. Take care. Take care. Thank you all for your patience with our technology.